Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, John Colmel, uh, pleased to uh, continue as your board chair and uh, welcome uh, my fellow trustees, uh, Kim and Balboni, Gonzalez, trainer, and virtually uh, Nick Candry, uh, to uh, this joint authority and canal uh, board meeting. Uh, the meeting's uh, been duly noticed and scheduled uh, pursuant to open uh, meetings law. And I'm pleased to uh, welcome our internal team as well under the able leadership of Justin Driscoll uh, and his uh, worthy cohorts here. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll call uh, this meeting uh, to order. Uh, we've all had a chance to uh, review uh, the proposed agenda. And uh, unless anyone has uh, thoughts on changes or additions, deletions uh, there too, I'd ask for a motion to approve and ad adopt the agenda as uh, presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Motion carries. Uh, as always, we've uh, been uh, polled in terms of uh, conflicts and the like, and I'm making sure there's no late breaking changes or uh, developments on that front. If not, uh, we have our typically uh, robust uh, agenda. Uh, our interim CEO and president will lead us off with his uh, view of the world uh, from the top of the house. Justin, the podium is yours. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning, trustees, uh, not colleagues, members of the public. I must say it's great to be back here in White Plains with all of you and that see uh, five trustees here at the table and our, our executive <coughs> team together. I'm feeling really good about that and also feeling really good about where we are organizationally here in 2022. So um, as, as we round out the first quarter of 2022, more than a full year into our Vision 2030 strategy, I want to take a little time to discuss just how that vision sort of drives progress and decision making uh, here, not, not just st strategically, but on a day to day basis in terms of the work that we do. So we often bring to you examples of how we're executing on our strategy, whether it's um, our Next Gen Niagara uh, initiative in how it relates to preserving the value of our hydro, but also um, you know our Clean Path New York transmission project and how that is put, how that's driving our um, desire to be a leader in transmission across the state, which is a key component of our strategy. So. As we um, hear our executive presentations from senior management today, you'll hear from Joe and Sarah and Adam, and they'll talk a little bit about how our Vision 2030 strategy informs the day-to-day, -day, you know, smaller decisions that the organization makes as we, as we execute on the strategy. Um, <clears throat> for example, Joe will talk about our White Plains um, Digital Engineering Lab. And um, Sarah will talk about our customer energy solutions efforts and, and how that's um, moving forward. And Adam will talk about our financial strength and how that underpins everything, everything that we do as an organization and helps us actually be able to do all the great things that we do here at NIPA. <clears throat> One other thing I'd like to point out to you that's uh, late breaking is that we just received an A plus grade from the state on our MWBE execution for 20 Perfect. fiscal year 2020 2021 yeah, a plus grade enough. and that that was really um something that made us very proud and and uh you, you have to understand the amount of work it takes in order to to achieve those kind of numbers so we're really proud of that we're not without our challenges Cybersecurity, of course is key and at the top of our minds today particularly given the environment that that we live in right now I can only say to you, and we've got our team here, um, we're, we're super vigilant, we're communicating, sharing information. That's the key to this game, is sharing information. We work with all our federal partners and we're, we're as well positioned as any organization could be uh, in that space. We also have supply chain issues that we're facing, like all other companies, costs are going up. That's impacting some of our projects. And just on a team and talent basis, we continue to, to um, <clears throat> work hard to compete for talent in this environment. And as I think we're all experiencing that, um, you know, in our, in our businesses and our, in our lives, and we're certainly no, no uh, exception here, here at NIPA. So in the face of those challenges, we always return back to the strategy, Vision 2030 strategy, and we ask ourselves, 
as we make decisions in the day-to-day -day operation of the of the enterprise. How are, how are those decisions bringing us closer to a thriving, resilient New York state powered by clean energy, which of course is our, is our roadmap and our, and our mission. So that brings us to our, our scorecard. Um, you'll see on the scorecard, we're all green. We started off 2022 and in great shape. Uh, I wanna um, just highlight a couple of things on commercial availability. You'll see that um, we're above, uh, we're at 97.7 uh, year to date versus um, a 95% target. Um, so that's uh, always great to see. And then on greenhouse gas saved, you'll see a, um, we're way above target there. That's a little bit of an aberration that's been um, driven by a, a, a substantial project we did for the Department of Corrections, which came in actually ahead of schedule and also a streetlight project in the village of Homer. So both uh, um, completed earlier than anticipated. So they're, they're driving that number higher than, than uh, it otherwise would be. So th these metrics provide just a glimpse of, um, of how day-to-day -day our focus is on driving the organization uh, and real realizing the Vision 2030 uh, strategy. So I'd like to spend the rest of my time highlighting one uh, project that we're- Justin, before you yes, jump sir. into that, uh, reflect further. <clears throat> So we're a quarter into the year, and as you said, whether it's geopolitical issues, supply chain issues, uh, and or other considerations that have evolved in a way that we didn't plan for, literally, uh, last fall, mm -hmm. what we were and weren't uh, aware, aware of. Any thoughts, concerns as to how we need to be more nimble, uh, more agile, uh, and mm -hmm. not to play off of your next presentation, but um, you, the team, as you think about um, our plan for the short term and ensuring we're on path for the longer, anything that we need to adapt and adjust uh, at, at this point? Well, I think <clears throat> one of the things I think we have to be paying really, really close attention to is that the, our customer base is um, very sophisticated and they call them prosumers now. They're very knowledgeable in terms of their energy needs and energy usage. And they're all focused on the decarbonization efforts that are taking place around mm -hmm. them. So I think we, I think one of the things that we need to focus on in the short term is staying really close to our customers, <clears throat> making sure that we're hearing their, their needs and that we're able to respond. Because we're not, you know, we have competition like other businesses. We're, you know, we're in a very competitive space, particularly uh, in the in the customer facing part of our business. So. I think we really need to stay uh, very close to the customer in the short term um, and be able to meet their meet their needs. And then, of course, on cyber, just uh, it's a it's a twenty four seven. It's all, like I said earlier, all about information sharing. We're we're tied in with all the appropriate entities and um, making best use of the information they provide to us. And and we're of course mm -hmm. considered a leader in the space, so we're sharing our information. We share with. Our muni and co-op customers that might not be as some of them might not have the sophistication that we have in the, in the cyberspace. So we're we're sharing information down, up, and and I think it's just a great partnership across the board. Um, so, uh, but we have to be on our toes for sure. Yeah, that customer view, you know, is important. I think we all hear it. Um, you know, back and forth with Adam uh, recently, and just talking about how we always assume hydro would be the lowest cost, the cheapest cost, and other options and alternatives and like that customer review, making sure we're consistently taking, you know, looking at it through the customer lens and working away from the customer back as opposed to just depending seems all the more critical in the rapidly evolving and changing. We So make sure we don't get too internally focused and lead with what we our perceived strengths only to find that were unduly exposed as a result of that. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly where we are. Just staying, staying close. You know, we've got programs now where we have customer assigned customer reps working with our customers directly, making sure that we stay close to them. And so I think it's um, it's something that we have to um, be be uh, di diligent about. But I think we're um, we're doing all we can to uh, stay close to the to the customers. Yeah, Michael. Yeah. So that uh, as we sit here today, the world's changed dramatically in terms of the need for renewable energies. And when you take a look at what's happening, obviously, in Ukraine, 
you see the fact that uh, Russia has their uh, the ability to turn off. It's your energy. mic. I don't know if you're. You should go green. Should go green. There, thank you. Um, so the world has changed, you know, the uh, and when you take a look at what's happening with Russia, the ability uh, for um, another country to turn off the ability, the, the availability of, of, of gas and really threaten uh, from an energy perspective, using energy as a weapon. Now the world is, is embracing, I think, at an accelerated pace, the decarbonization, the renewable. And I think that what NIPA now positions itself as not only the leader in this, but the dependable leader, you know, the investments that we've done in transmissions, the ability to, to ensure that we'll, we'll keep the lights on for the longest time and in a very um, studied way that we've done it, I think is, is a, an incredibly important message to everybody. And in the United States, we, we've embraced this, but it's kind of been you know, we haven't picked up the acceleration like an offshore wind and all the different opportunities we have. And I think that we are positioned even better now against this world picture of people saying, we don't want to be at the uh, at the mercy of some other society that decides that they, they want to use energy as a weapon. Um, and, and unfortunately, though, I think that uh, to your point, you know, cyber is, is that we're a target. You know, there's absolutely no doubt about it. But I'm so confident in the team you guys have assembled. And the work that they've done. Oh, thank you. I, and I, again, I couldn't agree more with you, Trustee Balboni. You know, if you think about NIPA and the role we play in New York State, we're, we're really the foundation of the energy delivery system, whether it's the hydro or the transmission, bulk transmission ownership and operation that we have. So we, we create that stability that in some parts of the world is, is lacking right now. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're proud of the role that we play. And of course, the balance of all that with the with uh, on a parallel track, the decarbonization efforts and the transition we're making is is certainly going to be challenging for the industry. But uh, we're up to it. We're up to the challenge. And if I could just to pile on, because mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I agree that we do have a unique position with regard to our transmission. Um, but generation slightly different. Right. And I'm so glad, as the chairman was talking about, that we're focusing on what where our customers are. Um, because we are, as the world has changed, what's happened is we will find that sometimes our customers can be competitors as they look for new options. And so making sure that we understand what their needs are and we're helping them meet their commitments in, you know, to reducing their, you know, carbon footprint. And so I'm very, you know, it excites me and pleases me when I hear that we're focused on where our customers are today and where they want to be and helping them meet their commitments and their mission that they have. And as long as we're doing that, I think we continue to be relevant for our customers mm -hmm. as they look at their, you know, their ability to satisfy their energy needs. I so. agree. I agree. Yeah. And, and hence, you know, I'd ask Justin, you and the team, I mean, scorecards, you know, I'm all about scorecards, uh, but uh, scorecards are tracking progress relative to where we expected to find ourselves versus where we are. Uh, so please ensure that that stays as dynamic as it needs to be so that we don't give ourselves a, a solid grade for executing the plan that we had versus what did we accomplish relative to what was needed and expected in light of this rapidly changing environment. So think about how our scorecard be, can be a little more dynamic or reflect. I'm, I'm not saying I'm looking for us to replan every quarter and all the rest of that, but there clearly are changing dynamics that are significant and impactful and should influence how we're prioritizing, how we're allocating resources, how we're accelerating opportunities or navigating challenges. So <clears throat> let's think about how we do it because we've all learned you said it's been a few months since we've all been together and the world is dramatically different in, in those few months. Scary different in some respects mm -hmm. and you know, just bizarrely different in others. And yeah, we don't want to do other than deliver the best case outcomes, but that assumes that you know our focus uh, pivots as well from that traditional thinking to one that's very dynamic and nimble. No implication we aren't and you aren't doing that, but I think it just needs to be 
uh, I'm already pulling of uh, discussion. Does that okay. make sense? No, or? it does. It's essentially, don't get too locked into a form of reporting or a scorecard. Yeah, and and make sure that it's reflecting the dynamic changes that are taking place in the in, in the industry and and at NIPA. And almost if we if we lead with a bit of a, well, and here's the state of the world, you know, relatively yeah. speaking, mm -hmm. uh, on a quarterly basis, and here's how we line up, or here's what we're doing differently, or here's how we're either anticipating or worst case reacting to that. So that it is very dynamic since it's much more uh, evolved. It's evolving much more rapidly than any of us could have forecast uh, or anticipated. Yeah, it's funny, just on that on that point, you, you could actually almost take for granted that, that we've got a scorecard with all green, which I haven't seen in, in a while. That's great. And we just keep on going, but we just came out from a pandemic. You know, when you think about it, we, we, what were our economic assumptions two years ago? And yet we really haven't seen the decline, right? It's almost like it never happened from the standpoint of the scorecard and what now our mission. But then as the chairman said, I think it's it's really important not to take that for granted and to have perhaps a, a look at what else is happening around us so that we can inform some of the decisions that we make. Great. Yeah, well, and even, you know, as Adam will talk more, so we've had a strong start to the year because... Uh, the public markets are pricing different, you know, as they're reacting. On the other hand, that's created exposure for us. So it's just, you know, how do we, yeah. you know, respond to all of that? So again, no implication you aren't, but just want to make sure our discussions here, and frankly, reporting out to the public, make that clear in terms of what we're doing. So the world doesn't, and the sands don't shift, and all of a sudden the tides moved out and where we thought we were comfortable, um, knee deep in the water, it's either left us or it's over our head. So great. Okay. Okay. So Find think it. about, you know, how that goes. Uh, so the value of scorecards uh, to me is somewhat limited when it's, uh, you know, this uh, dynamic and fluid. Okay. All right. Understood. Okay. <clears throat> so if I could then, uh, I'd like to spend the, the rest of my presentation just updating you on our agile lab. You'll recall Agile is our advanced grid innovation laboratory for energy. We came to you in 2017 um, with Agile, which, as you know, is a key component of our digitization strategy, along with the so ISO. You fast five times. Digitization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And I try to avoid that word at all costs. <laughs> some, then they told us it's not digitization anymore. It's digitalization. <laughs> 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 so, uh, uh, so we we came to you in 2017 with this initiative. Um, I believe you authorized 40 million dollars. We've drawn down 20 million dollars against that. Actually expended $7 million so far. And as the point is, we've gotten a lot of value out of that $7 million. And we're really excited about where we are with the lab. It's taken us about three years to load in the grid modeling into the, into the lab, which allows us to run a lot of the, um, a lot of the work that, that we're doing there. Um, <clears throat> Agile is a state-of-the-art collection of technologies, devices, and systems to support various studies on planning and operation of the power grid. Um, as we move forward toward realizing Governor Hochul's clean energy vision, the increased complexity of the grid and huge increases in renewable energy coming online will require more granular studies of just how, just what happens to the grid as you add these resources. So one of the things, as I understood it, when it was first uh, discussed that we wanted to do is if, if an offshore wind, I mean, if a, uh, if a solar farm or a wind farm was gonna be added to the grid in a particular location, we could model what impact that would have on system, on reliability and power flows and so forth. And it's gotten more sophisticated um, since then. Now we're, we're working with NYSERDA and Department of Energy, and we're looking at uh, how offshore wind will impact uh, the grid and modeling that through the system. On, on through the lab. So we're now able to model the uh, the grid from 765 kV all the way down to 37.5 kV in, in the Agile lab. So we're really excited about the work that's being done there. Um, I have the team on, on with us to discuss or answer any questions uh, that you might have. But one of the things that we're, um, we wanted to report out to you is a recent, um, a re some recent work we did on cyber in the lab, which is really, 
which was really an important initiative, um, we were able to run an attack simulation on the grid uh, without having to actually uh, take the system offline or have a have a you know an outage of any kind to to simulate that activity. So we were able to, through the use of this Dragos platform, uh, simulate an attack through the yeah. through the um, through the lab and. Uh, so um, very, very mm -hmm. exciting and That's actually, good. actual, actually meaningful work coming out of the lab. It's, you know, it sounded like very theoretical. Now we're, we're actually having real uh, outcomes from that work. So um, we're, we're super proud of, um, super proud of that initiative and just wanted to point out to you um, some of the uh, successes that we've, um, that we've achieved through, through this work. So of course we'll share, we'll share all that um, all that work with other industry partners and um, the, the Stragos initiative and the attack simulation was done around our uh, Niagara uh, next gen um, OT operations. And now we're gonna do the same thing at uh, St. Lawrence and BG. So, uh, so we're really excited about, about the, that. The value of this cannot be understated. Um, we, in the industry, there, you don't really have test beds. You don't have the ability to truly test when you have new technologies as you and put them into an, an ecosystem. And one of the things that a lot of people don't recognize is that you know there have been attacks based upon the fact that you have um, out of date or legacy uh, applications or unpatched applications. Well, people don't recognize that when you patch something, you can have a cascading effect that you don't see the impacts on the ecosystem. This lab, one of the, the first of its kind in the country, but as it relates to grid, you're able to do that and test what the application will do or what the technology will do without impacting the system itself. This is pretty dramatic. And there are no test beds like this. You know, it's, it's, um, when you talk to folks in the industry, they all want to get a part of this because they can actually see that their technology works without impacting okay, So what kept, oh, I'm sorry, Tracy, go ahead. No. So that then leads to the question I was going to have is how do we have a lot, we had just had a discussion about meeting our customers and helping them satisfy their needs. And how do we then take advantage of this technology to the benefit of our customers? <clears throat> you said, you know, we approved 40 million, you drew down 20 million, you've only spent 7 million. Is there more we can do? Because it's not a financial constraint. So mm. to make sure that this is something that's accessible and usable to our customers, because as you said, it's, it's, this great technology, we should be able to help our customers be able to deploy it from a cyber perspective, as well as being able to manage their, I mean, I look at what it, the capabilities of this, it's kind of endless. And so how do we think about allowing access, not just for our own internal use to be able to do, you know, digital tabletop exercises, but mm -hmm. application and use by our customers to help them, um, uh, serve their needs. Yeah, and I think it's a great question. One thing I, I could highlight for you is that we um, are working with our Muni and Co-op customers in a, with a, a collective defense model mm -hmm. through IronNet, uh, General Alexander's company. And so we've, we're doing a pilot right now with five, five of our Muni and Co-op customers. And we're, we're going to be using the lab in connection with that collection defense effort. So I know the team is on Hossein and Vic and, and Eric, if you want to add to that, but uh, that's one, one, uh, one customer facing uh, activity that we're using the lab on is the collective defense initiative. Anything else team? Good morning, everyone. Am I being heard? <laughs> yes, yes. 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 We're, we're also working with uh, CISA and DHS for a cyber hygiene program with our municipalities and co-ops helping them to um, remediate vulnerabilities in their environment that they may not have been aware of before they become an issue. Mm -hmm. Also um, working with them on incident response readiness, putting together incident response plans for their benefit in case they uh, run into a cyber event that they need to respond to. And so they could be more self-sufficient. And another- Yeah, I'm out of my element here, but pick up, up on the point. Oh, sorry. Apologies. No, trying to get in. I'm sorry. So another another thing that we're planning to um, add to the lab is expand the capabilities of the lab and um, initiating 
um, the creation of a digital twin of the New York State system so that it covers not only the transmission systems as, as Justin mentioned, but also the distribution. Um, and by having a digital twin of the grid, we can predict the immediate future if something, um, if we wanna add uh, like a wind um, farm or solar farm to the grid right now at this moment, and we wanna know what happens in the next few minutes, this is something that the digital twin can provide us and a few other capabilities that we have in the queue uh, to basically realize uh, this year and in the coming years. Thank you. Well, all I was going to say is what stops us, educate me here, I'm not saying I'm right, but what stops us from promoting this, reaching out proactively to our customers and saying, here's a resource, here's a tool, here's a skill set uh, that we have that's available for you to use, or what can we do? The, you know, the old you know, multiplier effect here. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, yeah. I don't think there's yeah. anything stopping yeah. us from doing that. Uh, no, no. So. I mean, we, we work very closely with our 51 <laughs> meetings and co-ops and we have an innovation and technology committee that services them, mm -hmm. which supports them in being leading uh, by getting like their first electrified bucket trucks. And, and we have been working very closely to determine um, how we can leverage the technologies that we have to ensure going back to the comments that we're, it's pulling from the customer, right? right? Obviously, in some cases, we may be more sophisticated and you don't know what you um, you know, don't know. But that being said, I think that the pilot that Justin mentioned is very strong. We also have the ISOC. We also looked at supporting the monitoring of their transformers and some of their other grid, uh, grid assets there to help also to uh, threat detection. So this isn't anything new. We are consistently co-developing with our customers uh, because they want to be on the leading edge and they look to NIPA as the trusted energy advisor. So uh, this is a good example of one thing. The the cyber cybersecurity is another, and then just ISOC uh, monitoring too. So uh, we'll just continue to to work with them and, and ensure that uh, we we bring to bear the assets and and the knowledge that we have. Yeah, I sure. think there's nothing holding us back from, from offering lab, lab, lab uh, already, yeah, yeah, uh, access or I mean, we have to talk to the team and, and see what would be best suited for the customers. But I mean, it's something that like any other product and service, we should think creatively mm -hmm. about offering it to our customer base. Yeah. And, you know, the classic, uh, those who can, you know, need to help uh, and we're, you know, in a position of strength and that's what leaders do. So we don't want to just protect internally. We want to, you know, protect all those we serve. And you know, how can we provide access and, and availability and lift others up when everyone's feeling all the more exposed? So right. and at risk. The last piece on this is that there's also an ability to identify best in class technologies. You know, which which is, everyone will market everything to you, and they'll tell you we've got the best, you know, widget. Mm -hmm. This allows you to actually go in and say, okay. This is the technology that really hits what they say they're going to hit. And that net, you, there's so many places where that just doesn't happen. And people are just trying to sell you something. So this, again, adds tremendous value, not only to NIPA, but to all the, all the customers that we serve. At the same time, I just wanted to add, um, we're being very mindful in terms of commitment and expectation management. So we're incrementally building this lab. So it's taken a lot of time to build the lab itself. They call it the, you know, the digital twin as it's also referred to. So just to provide all of the data behind it, to qualify that data uh, is tremendous. And I applaud Hussein and the team to get us to this point. <clears throat> but we have numerous use cases, applications, and, and Trustee McKibben, to your point, there's a backlog. So we're just being very mindful not to overcommit because we do have agreements in place that we need to make and make sure that we're committing and delivering on those simulations while at the same time leveraging what NIPA needs. And cyber is a, a classic example. So we're trying to be very agile with the agile lab, but also <laughs> not overcommit. And I think we're in a great position. And to your point, Michael, this is high demand. This is very unique uh, in the industry overall. So we're also trying to be careful with that as well uh, and how we expose ourselves or bring in partners. So mm -hmm. tremendous work. We're getting tremendous value to, to Justin's point, but I am very adamant that let's not overcommit. Let's make sure we can continue to deliver. I appreciate that because it's, a, you know, there's only so much you can do. You, you can throw money at a lot of things, mm -hmm. but still the capacity, your ability and doing this in a very diligent and, you know, 
um, way is probably what's most important, making sure it, it works as you intended to. And you, as long as you're being led by data that's coming in and sort of how it, customers are being responded, how it's being used, it's totally fine. Understood. Yeah, and, and you know, um, within the commercial operations group, we established a product development and marketing group in the last couple of years, and that's really to be diligent in the science and the art of product development, because we don't want to just push out technologies for the sake of pushing out technologies. We're looking to solve a problem. So we've undertaken um, in the last um, couple of years um, the development of this process and the institutionalization of true product development and, in, and informing that with in depth um, customer um, insights and, and customer uh, journey mapping. Because again, we can do a lot of things, but we wanna do what is really solving problems and meeting our customers' needs and uh, ensuring that we're focused on the right things. Yeah, absolutely. All right, good discussion. So yeah, in closing, I'm, I'm, I'm excited and proud about where we are in terms of executing the strategic vision and thank the trustees for your leadership and guidance along the way. Okay, super. Anything else for Justin? All right, thanks very much, Thank Justin. You. Well done. Uh, Joe, uh, operations uh, space. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, trustees, and members of the public staff, uh, welcome. I did have a couple of projects that uh, I was gonna just brief you on um, regarding the, the normal presentation, but I wanna build a little bit on the discussion we just had here on, on Vision 2030. Uh, first of all, I just wanna assure the board that you know so far this year, we're hitting on all cylinders and operations as well. Um, our traditional metrics that we talk about around safety and reliability, uh, we're hitting those. Uh, what, what you'll see in your report, and it's not gonna be presented here, um, but as you go through your materials, which you'll see is we've also adopted those uh, KPIs as well to talk about the things that you just mentioned, really gearing our, our operational metrics toward the business and how we're performing from a business perspective. So where you've seen generator market readiness or transmission reliability, which are pure uh, reliability metrics, now you're going to see things like hydro um, you know, generation readiness where uh, we're actually taking that percentage and, and equating it to a net uh, income so that you have an ability to see what the real business impacts are on that. So hopefully you see that. In terms of the overall strategy and Vision 2030 and how we're uh, addressing it, it's resonating with our staff. And I've had an opportunity in the uh, first quarter here to get out to the staff in some of the quarterly staff meetings uh, at the sites. And uh, frankly, I quizzed them on what they thought Vision 2030 was. <laughs> I see Eve smiling over here because he, he kind of challenged me to do this. And um, there are, you know, members that, uh, you know, people that uh, work for us that don't quite connect yet, but they do see the ones that immediately align with them, which is good. And we're building from there to help them understand what we're trying to do to preserve the value of hydro, which is the one they all understand and expanding uh, transmission. And uh, to that end, what you're going to- It's gonna... always repetition, Joe. Yeah, repetition, it's... repetition, repetition, it so... repetition. Honestly, thematically, just open-ended questions, they, they do get it. And actually, where I think they actually really, what really resonates with them is some of our foundational pillars. So around DEI and ESG, some of our digitalization efforts and things like that, resilience, they're, they're getting it. Mm -hmm. They understand that that's a big piece of what we're trying to do. So that part was good. Um, to that end, I, what you're going to see in the next, uh, I think, few months from uh, operations, uh, is, you know, Sarah and I have been collaborating. You're going to see a lot of organizational changes announced around aligning the staff to do exactly what we need to do. And one example that we recently performed, and we're getting uh, uh, some positive feedback, is we took production cost analysis, um, uh, I'm sorry, production cost analysis, system planning, and energy economics, and put them <coughs> in one group. Um, now, those were three separate mm -hmm. groups that kind of were uh, working independently, but always correlated with each other. And whenever a project came into our organization, um, it was always, I think, a challenge for our customers and even some of our own staff to understand where do we start with some of these analyses. So under Bruce Fardnish, now we have all three of these groups together. So whether it comes from uh, Phil Toya's group in, in, in business development or NIPA development, or if it comes from uh, licensing, it comes from even reimagine the canals, um, any project that has some kind of economic impact or something that impacts our system, um, this group can look at it in aggregate and uh, work from there. So you'll see some changes in that area. And also we're thinking of areas around project delivery uh, to build on some of the synergies we have in different groups that were built up over the years to see if we can build capacity in the organization to um, deliver projects and have diverse ways of delivering projects uh, for Vision 2030. So um, 
And then decarbonization, uh, a lot of good points made around resilience uh, today and some of the uh, diversity of fuels that we need and diversity of energy sources that we need to be, make sure that we're resilient and delivering for our customers. Um, we're having uh, a lot of discussions around hydrogen, our role in hydrogen. We are part of the proposal for, with NYSERDA and um, DPS on, um, or PSC rather, on the, uh, on the um, um, uh, hydrogen, uh, the funding, federal funding for hydrogen projects in the hub. Uh, so we're going to continue to do that. And um, what we're recognizing is, is that, you know, the conventional technologies that we have that we're scaling up right now are, are good and are going to get us a lot of the way there. But I feel, and I think the group feels that those out years, the answer is unknown yet. And to, we have to get started now and discovering uh, what some of those solutions might be. So hydrogen is one that we're taking a look at and there may be others in the future. So uh, continue to look at that. Uh, so with that said, Joe, before, before you jump yeah, in, sure. so playing off of the conversation, you know, we just had you referenced it, but as you look ahead and as you see the, the world evolving at a more rapid pace or in a different way, what, from an operations standpoint, what is it that you're focused on? Or what is it that you think are higher risk or areas that uh, we potentially need to pivot on or think differently about, if anything? Yeah, I think, you know, where we got, I don't want to say too comfortable, but where, where we are comfortable is that, um, you know, the generation, hydro generation, large scale hydro generation and transmission is in our wheelhouse. And I think what we're learning is we got to be a little more agnostic as an organization around where this tech, what the technology is going forward. Um, and I, honestly, this is a lesson I learned from the canal system uh, where, you know, they put in God knows how much money over time and years, decades to build a, a transportation system that is virtually obsolete except for a recreational facility and has, but in terms of commercial shipping is obsolete. So it's now no longer hard for us to imagine would hydro go the way of some other large assets mm -hmm. in the future? Should we start thinking about that differently? And so, you know, that's where we want to be more competitive. So I've been working with Daniela, for example, on Next Gen Niagara. What, what else should we be doing there? Even though that's in flight, things have been approved, contracts are in place and we're moving. It's a, it's a decades long program. What's gonna be different at the end of that program that we should right. be thinking about? So that, I think we're all just thinking a little bit more differently that way. We're a little more agnostic about um, uh, the technology recognizing that renewables have to be there. Hydrogen is something that's not in our portfolio now, uh, but is that something we should consider? And what role would NIPA play in that? Is it purely from policy or, or making sure that transmission lines are effectively transmitting electricity from A to B or energy from A to B for hydrogen? or is it hydrogen generation? I, I would say today, nothing's off the table and we just have to continue to, to poke and probe and see what, what's uh, good for us. I always go back to the days that we didn't have a single asset. You know, I, I wasn't there, but you know, man, 90 years ago, we didn't have a single asset and we became what we were generation and transmission over time. And now, you know, that role of doing what other people can't do, that's what I think of now is our, is our role again, you know, and trying to understand all the different threats, whether it's uh, the, the, the geopolitical issues, social issues, whatever they are, and kind of cranking that into our plan. Well, Colin uh, reinforces you said it's the wrong time to be comfortable. Right. Um, right. And the strength you know, can quickly become a weakness. So, uh, you know, appreciate the thoughts. Tracy. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I fully, the analogy you raised around the canal, I think is absolutely appropriate. And the way you're thinking about what I call how your future proofing our operations hmm. is exactly what you should be doing because right. we should not be comfortable. Our customers are being dynamic. We need to be dynamic. So um, this is exactly what we should be doing. Right. Good Great. to hear. Um, am I advancing slides? And I'd ask you to keep coming back with, yeah. you know, the thoughts and ideas. Let's keep talking about that, you know, within the context of how are we pivoting, evolving, being more nimble. Think about that. So that's just a point of an ongoing discussion. With Absolutely. Us, okay? Absolutely. Um, so just want to touch on a couple of projects that kind of uh, hit us up a couple of these points. One is that uh, right here in this building on the 12th floor, we built this uh, digital engineering lab. This is not the agile lab. This is a little bit different. This is actually for our engineers to kind of poke and prod around uh, protection mm -hmm. of equipment and things like that. Uh, so this digital engineering lab is located on 12th floor, combines NIPA engineering expertise from various groups into one lab space. Again, breaking down silos of different groups that were working on different things. Uh, the new lab uh, moves the people into an integrated space as technology, breaking down silos, as I, I said. And um, there's, a, there's a technology, IEC 61850, that is, is going to be the future of all new substations um, that people are talking. It's a digital technology for substations and protection. 
And uh, every Greenfield project we put in place going forward with all the interconnections that we have in play is likely to have that. This lab is gonna give us an opportunity to use that technology and, and, and test and calibrate instruments before they even get out into the field for these things as well. Um, it provides them for uh, engineering to provide enhanced testing, um, greater project performance and troubleshooting as well. Uh, so we have a, we've had where we, an incidental trip on a unit or a, a piece of equipment and we needed to understand exactly what happened. We can recreate some of those scenarios in this lab and say, oh, there's a setting that might need to be adjusted to, to support that. Um, again, this is in line with Vision 2030. And one of the things that it also um, occurred to me when I went there is that if I was an engineer, I probably wouldn't get out of that lab. It was, you know, still an engineer back then. Uh, I wouldn't get out of this lab. It was really the, the staff that's working in there, love it. So we also see it as kind of a, a retaining tool, a retraction tool as people who are trying to recruit folks. It's something that uh, uh, we think they would really enjoy being a part of if they're here. Like I said, uh, you know, mid-career, then I was doing some engineering like that. I don't know if it can get me out of there. That's terrific. Next slide, please. So your cubicle engineer, Frank. My cubicle engineer. You would have set your cubicle <laughs> John remembers. Right in there. Frank. <laughs> yeah. I would have been in one of those cubes right there. Um, this is another project just that shows in collaboration with some of our other um, uh, agencies that we support. Um, new York Power Authority recently completed a new facility located in Louisville, New York, uh, which replaces the previously leased space for the New York uh, um, DEC. Uh, the wildlife team at, is at that facility and manages uh, the Wilson Hill Refuge, uh, which is adjacent to the building along the migratory bird management of that area. Uh, so the Wilson Hill Refuge is an authority property that is part of the uh, St. Lawrence FDR um, power project boundary line. And uh, it had, the site has uh, access and public boat uh, launching as well. Uh, so it was executed through a design build model. So again, touching on our, our multi uh, project delivery methods, whatever is most effective to manage risk and to expedite projects appropriately. Uh, this was design build with construction completed in late 2021. And the DEC personnel moved into the space to, uh, this year, earlier this year. So if the facility is about 3,400 square feet and a host office space, as well as garage space for vehicles and boats. And this just is another indication of the kinds of things that uh, from an op the operations perspective that we're, we're dealing with in terms of project come to us from all different directions. Um, their generation transmission to support our, our own assets. Uh, there's development for uh, the work that uh, Phil Toya brings in in terms of transmission. Uh, but there's also licensing projects, other community projects that we have to deliver, not to mention everything that Sarah will talk about probably shortly in, in terms of commercial operations, energy services, and so forth. So having a, a, a team that's aggregated together to, to, uh, to help deliver all those projects in whatever way is appropriate to most effectively support them is something that we're keen on working on in the next year here. So, so, so you'll see some changes in project delivery coming. Yeah, when I saw this one, this was sort of outside the box. In yeah. my view. I'm like, we do commercial uh, de construction. Remind, it reminds me of the chimney that. we moved. Yeah, no, but it is important for us to be flexible in assisting our customers and their needs. And so I assume this is the kind of cooperation, again, also being, you know, a responsible uh, corporate, we're not corporate player in the communities that we're in. So I assume this is one of those projects where we, we had a customer who had a need and we were flexible enough within our operations to help them be able to realize what, the what their needs were. Yeah. So. yeah, and sometimes when we think of our competency, it's really around either asset management or project delivery. It's not, you know, generation transmission is what, you know, we think of from an operation, but we really right. do deliver projects and we can we can just about deliver anything if we know what the, the, the uh, design criteria are. So. Yeah, great, good stuff. This and with that, uh, those are- Anything else for Joe? Judge, it, judge yeah. anything? This, this particular project also enables the authority to, fulfill its obligations under its license to maintain and foster the area enclosed in the in the project boundary. So, you know, it not only helps DEC, but it helps us fulfill our obligations as well in managing the area under our uh, auspices. So it's a it's a good project. Thank you, Judge. B, Dennis, anybody, anything else? All right, super. Thanks, Thanks very thank much, you. Joe. Appreciate it. All right, a lot to chat about customers. Uh, Sarah, you're on the you're on the point every day. I'm just gonna say, keep singing the song. I will. Okay, so happy spring to everybody that came here for 24 degree weather. Uh, but no, I want to thank. Good morning. I want to thank the board 
very much um, for the recognition and the focus and continued support with respect to our customers. Um, when I joined uh, NIPA uh, three and a half years ago, it was very focused on, on, on the customer and introducing customer satisfaction metrics. So we really are hearing from them in an unbiased uh, way, uh, how we're doing, uh, introducing product development um, as well to ensure that, again, we're taking the, the uh, insights that we have from our customer and delivering services that they really need and want. Uh, specifically too, relative to your comment, uh, chairman on being dynamic. Uh, when we issued Vision 2030, uh, my group uh, developed uh, two key strategies, one behind the meter strategy and one uh, commercial electricity supply strategy, which took into account uncontrollable variables in the market and developed high, medium, and low scenarios for the growth of our specific business lines. It's something that we're revisiting on an annual basis because as you pointed out, we have to be dynamic. What was working last year or what was an, an assumption in terms of achievable targets one year will change from the next. So we are very focused on the dynamics of the market. As chief commercial officer, I'm very focused on ensuring that we develop and execute commercial strategies to meet our vision 2030. And that fundamentally is around remaining competitive in the energy markets, the wholesale energy markets where we're contracting and bidding our assets. We can't take that for granted. And secondly, when it comes to other energy services products that we also are remaining competitive and remaining leading in the state uh, as well as in the nation. So to that end, the chief, uh, the uh, commercial team is specifically focused on three initiatives within Vision 2030, preserving and enhancing our hydro. And around that, it's the commercial electricity supply, ensuring that we are remaining again competitive from a cost structure standpoint, both direct and indirect costs um, in the market to contract ongoing long-term. Uh, that we also are being recognized for the value of our hydro attributes relative to the fact that NIPA represents 60% of the renewable baseline to get us to uh, uh, emission-free grid in 2040, and that we continue to advance the commercial structuring and incorporate the new renewable assets that are coming into the market and maintain the customer contracts being, as Joe said, potentially agnostic to, to where the power is coming from because the, the value in the market is migrating to the customer and who owns the customer contract. And we absolutely have to retain that. The second uh, area of focus for initiatives is responsibly transitioning off of fossil fuels by 2035. We clearly continue to bid and contract our in-city assets to reliably provide for the capacity to ensure that the lights stay on, yet we still continue to support analysis to identify ways to incorporate renewables, storage, and other uh, technologies, hydrogen as well, to evolve our assets and to support the decarbonization of um, the fossil units. And then third, customer in the state, needless to say, decarbonizing the customer in the state and evolving our products and services to be able to ensure that we're providing our customers with the adequate knowledge and expertise for the trade-off discussions so that they can most cost-effectively reach um, the sustainability outcomes that we're looking for. Um, next slide. So just at a high level, as, as you know, we've had a strong start to the year. January was particularly strong, we had over 40, 40 million above target. Uh, and that was predominantly due to the colder colder weather. Also too, going back to the management of our, our, of our um, uh, generating assets in the city, we took advantage and about a quarter of those results was as a result of us owning firm transportation rights across the gas pipelines and enabling to um, get the spread between where things are delivered in Pennsylvania and where we are selling them in New York. So again, we're consistently optimizing our, our bidding and ensuring that we take advantage of, of the real-time market. Hopefully we'll have an ongoing above target through the end of the year. We do see some speculation in the, in the fuel prices, which are obviously having an impact, uh, but have been seeing a little bit of a settling because in the end, we're not 
subject to the same um, constraints in terms of energy supply that you know, other parts of the world are relative to Ukraine. So we do see a little bit of speculation in the market, but, but we're seeing a settling uh, in, and some lowering in the gas prices going forward. Uh, economic development, again, we had one of the highest allocations in 2021. And uh, before you today in, in the agenda, you'll be approving uh, allocations that are eliciting 2,100 jobs, over 620 million in capital investments, over 1,000 green jobs, and over 240 uh, DEI jobs. We introduced, as you know, new metrics um, as part of the overall methodology to support uh, the creation of green jobs as part of the CLCPA, as well as uh, recognize uh, MWBE, SDVOB, and uh, companies that are operating and providing jobs in disadvantaged communities. Next slide. This is just an overview to show you what our targets are for 2022. In the end, we're focused on continuing to provide EBITDA positive margins from all our customer business lines. And that comes from fundamentally an ongoing strong portfolio year over year in our energy efficiency, in our DER advisory services. And you'll see here too with e-mobility, we're looking to learn from our experience in the first full year of implementation and, and go from 60 to 80 in terms of the numbers of chargers that we're going to implement this year. You'll also see the only other change there was going from 55 million in contracts signed with our customers uh, to 9 million this year. That's because last year we signed up the MTA and a couple of larger transit authorities. And uh, it's it's a little bit lumpy. There aren't an infinite number of transit agency outs out there and the, and the MTA is an extremely large one. Sarah, just on this slide, mm -hmm. what would be helpful? Um, and I know you, there's a slide where you've got the green, green, yellow, red, yep. or green, red, gray. Um, that helps us, but when we when you present this kind of information, when we look at the results of 21, it would be helpful to understand whether or not that met what our targets were, as opposed to just referencing our 22 targets. Right. Because it and it's more to inform us of what you know what your needs are, and then to have a discussion around what you're do doing differently in 22 to overcome if there were any um, uh, shortfalls and what we what our results were in 21. Yeah, sure. So going forward, it'd be helpful to have that. Like, you know, I see the numbers. Mm -hmm. Is that where we expect it to be? Yeah. Right. So. No, for sure. I, I can revisit that. And going forward, I, 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 um, I do believe I shared the results of the full year at the prior meeting. Okay. I was really looking to 2022 just for you to see how we'd adapted relative to the results. But right. I can yeah. provide at the next meeting uh, a 2021 target versus 2021. In the end, we met all of our targets. Last year, the one area was e-mobility where right. we didn't meet the evolved charger um, uh, implementation. Right. And I know we'll have a discussion around and this yeah. so we can have a discussion yeah. about why we didn't meet that. Sure. As you've presented what your targets are for 22, sure. and that's informed by why we didn't meet 21, right? Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. So I um, wanted to give you a high level overview again of the progress that we've made relative to the three different kind of core uh, customer business areas. Uh, first, you know, our energy efficiency program has been ongoing since the 1990s. We've spent or helped implement over three and a half billion dollars worth of energy efficiency projects. Fundamentally, this has bottom line energy savings for our customers, and it also is reducing the numbers of uh, renewable energy that we have to build on the supply side. So helping us get to an emissions-free grid by 2040 in the most cost-effective way possible. I'd like to highlight um, EO88. NIPA was asked uh, by the governor to administer and manage this program. It was to work with all of the state agencies in order to reduce their energy usage intensity, that is energy usage over square footage. Uh, we worked on that um, through uh, to the end of 2020 and achieved over 20%, you'll see here between committed as well as implemented projects met the goals that we had. As part of that program, we undertook audits at the different facilities. We presented the options to our customers, and then we worked in collaboration with them on the projects they chose to pursue going forward. And fundamentally, uh, we included both uh, implemented and committed projects because 
for some of the larger campuses, they're usually a three-year implementation period between scoping and implementation and, and final, uh, final, final, final COD or commercial operation date. So feel very good about the work we've done there, but it's not enough to meet the CLCPA. And so we're building on that with no pun intended, Build Smart 2025, where we have uh, additional goals for reduction in energy consumption. And what I would highlight here is that of our energy efficiency portfolio, over 50% of it is working towards supporting our agencies in reducing their energy consumption. So Sarah, on this energy efficiency, because you know so much of the easier work has been done, yeah. um, and do you feel like we're being... Uh, ambitious enough and trying to meet, I, you've got a plan, right? And that's what, you know, sort of the targets you've set around yeah. this area. Because it is getting harder and harder to figure out how we help our, you know, both in terms internally as well as externally with our customers achieve their energy efficiency goals. Do you feel like we're, I, I assume you've laid out a plan, so you do feel like we're being ambitious enough, but is there more that we can do to help move the needle because it's getting harder and harder taking more and more to do that because all the easy stuff has been done right no yes i agree i mean the low-hanging fruit ha has been there but what we see is there's ongoing evolution of technology which enables us to incorporate even more efficient appliances as they come to the end of their life i would say the one area where we're focused on now and where there is a lot of opportunity um it, but it, it's also um costly is the electrification, right, of the heating and the cooling and the buildings. And we're working currently with NYCHA to support the implementation of that and in one of their um, houses. And we continue to work with other state agencies and, and, and authorities to identify ways to tackle the electrification of, of, yeah. of, of buildings in addition to of the transport industry, because those are, you know, two areas that are, are high on the list in terms of, of emissions when you just move away from the pure supply side of the energy sector. Right, great, thanks. Great, next slide. Uh, so e-mobility, as, as you know, uh, we launched Evolve New York a couple of years ago. It fundamentally was looking at NYPA being a true market animator and leader in a space uh, where we would step in where the private sector was not yet ready to uh, because of the economics of implementing public facing fast chargers. And we were looking at supporting and addressing range anxiety, enabling anybody that came into New York state to drive north to south, east to west without having fear of not being able to charge their vehicles. And so we attempted to put and identify locations for that based on a number of criteria, but fundamentally to address range anxiety and ensuring that we had adequate charging across all of the major corridors. As you know, the OSC audit uh, that we worked on and, and were very responsive to, uh, over the over several months, um, you know, uh, had some comments uh, for us that we were surprised by, considering how we had set out the objectives of the Evolve program. Uh, yet we took them on board, and obviously are looking to continue to improve. Uh, my comments specifically there are that uh, one of the programs that they commented on that didn't meet its objectives was a statewide objective. It wasn't something that NIPO was specifically managing. Mm -hmm. And uh, another uh, finding was around where the where the charges were being placed that they should be placed in areas with higher vehicle penetration. But fundamentally, that was counter to really what the objective of the of the of the evolve initiative was. So we did we do agree that there's a lot more to be done. Forty percent of the greenhouse gas emissions in New York State come from the transport industry. So we absolutely have to continue working in that with Evolve uh, and, and with our customers to support the transition to electrification of medium and light duty vehicles and, and the work that we're doing with the bus transit agencies and, and the local schools with their bus system our areas where, where we're focused. And, and we are working very closely with our agency and authority uh, brethren to identify ways to accelerate and on a very holistic basis. Uh, the work that we're doing, the electrification of the transport industry. 
uh, we do, uh, we did incorporate a lot of the lessons learned from last year to, to your comment, um, Trustee McGibbon, and we're consistently looking to take in data and, and insights that we have to, to improve and, and to accelerate the work that we're doing in, in the electrification area. So we talk about this every yeah. meeting. You, you present this to us every meeting. Yeah. So as you're staying here today, I mean, and you look ahead, the less, what lessons can you say we've learned in terms of how we better uh, anticipate or how we can better execute uh, mm -hmm. our plan going forward? How do we need to modify our plan? Yep, I'm disappointed to see the controller's report. Yeah imply you know we've we've been asleep at the switch or whatever on a topic we discuss uh as i said literally uh every board meeting and we've talked about the barriers and obstacles and challenges that have put us behind schedule so in in terms of improving our own execution um what are your key takeaways at this point or what should our key takeaways be as to how we're pushing forward even more efficiently or as efficiently as we can no, I appreciate the question. I mean, fu fundamentally, uh, I think we were overly ambitious in the number of chargers we thought that we could install, having not actually done it. The, the time that it took in the end to get interconnection um, from the utilities. And again, as you'll hear kind of going forward, the impacts of, of supply chain, you know, ha ha did, did, Im did impact us. And so I think we've become uh, more reasonable and, and what's achievable, but we are looking at ways to work with um, the private sector to identify more readily uh, the locations where they could be uh, cited. And so we're really looking at strengthening public-private partnerships around this, you know, not to go it alone, but to see how we can leverage that so that the private sector can step in, you know, step in more, more quickly. So there's not one, one, one major takeaway because in order to go from scoping uh, and, and the host site agreements relative the negotiation of those took longer than we anticipated, mm -hmm. right? There, there are stores across uh, the individual owners of, of, of stores and other locations. So I think that, again, it's, it's a number of learnings that are coming together to be reasonable in terms of what we think we can be achieved and then identifying ways we can work, again, with our sister agencies to take a more holistic and, and comprehensive view on behalf of the state. And then, again, Think of more creative ways to work with the private sector for them to, you know, help help support us in that. Does that answer your question? You no, know, it's fine. I mean, I'm just trying to, as we've been chatting. I mean, the expectation, anticipation, electric vehicles yeah. moving quicker, further. We want to be an enabler. Yeah. And uh, while we might have been overly optimistic as to how many we can do. Frankly, we need to continue to yeah. find ways to deliver at least that, if not more, right? And solve the range anxiety yeah. issues, and you know all the rest of that. So, yeah. So to 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 your comment before, it's a dynamic market. Right. The number of, of vendors and suppliers that we saw two years ago is is a very is a small percentage of the ones that we see now. So I think what we're we're approaching, you know, a greater tipping point. And, and will continue to evolve and, 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 and readjust. I think that it's positive that we saw the 60 chargers last year and that we're, we're looking to do 80 this year, right? So we're looking to increase and take the learnings and continue to push ourselves and accelerate. Okay. Sarah, Sarah could you remind question. me? Um, the... One minute, Judge, one minute. Uh, yeah, B, go, go ahead. Could you remind me? You're one, not on. one minute, Judge. He can't yep. hear you that you were talking. Hold it. Hold on one minute, Judge. Lean on that B. Just hold it until it turns green. It's not working. Okay. It's harder. There you uh, go. Uh, um, <laughs> remind me um, the relationship and the service we're providing to all the other state agencies that park people, right? That where people might come and stay for a while. And how receptive they've been with the charger, with the e-chargers, like state parks, yeah. canals, for example, right? Sure, and any sure. other state facilities, yeah. yeah. No, so I think you know a good example of you of of, of what we were of state partner would be the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. We built out um, the largest public-facing uh, charger 
network at JFK. We're looking at doing one at LaGuardia. We've actually seen, and it's highlighted on the, on the screen or on the slide, higher utilization than we even anticipated. So that's you know, positive for us because it means that there's greater uptake, potentially more people buying vehicles. Uh, so we do have a lot of interest, to be honest, Beyond going back to customer insights, everybody being interested in solar plus storage, the electrification of fleets is the second thing that okay. I hear most when I meet with our customers because they recognize that's the next area that they need to focus on. So we do have a ton of interest coming, coming from you know, various customers on that. And it's a matter, again, from a commercial perspective of how we can have the greatest impact right, with the resources that we have to really meet the fundamental objective, which is decarbonizing the sector. Judge. Uh, Sarah, uh, back to range anxiety. Seems to me one of the issues about range anxiety is the question of severe minus zero weather on the range for the electric vehicles. And uh, I've never seen anything where it's explained, you know, on your car battery now, if it's in the cold weather, it's not gonna last very long. What's it like for an electric vehicle in cold weather as it relates to uh, the range of its, uh, its uh, uh, ability to go? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's definitely a technological mm -hmm. challenge. You also see that, frankly, with the electrification of buildings too, in areas where you have colder temperatures. When when we're putting the evolved stations, we're looking at roughly a fifty mile radius. I mean, many of the cars that are coming out now have a couple hundred mile radius. Hopefully, the some of the customers right that are buying them have chargers at home. So they're able to enable uh, the adequate charge. And once they're en route and need to stop, that our chargers are at sufficient distances such that, that the cold weather won't um, have, have a detrimental impact to the point where they would get stuck on a, on a throughway. And hopefully manufacturers are explaining that yes. to their customers. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I've got a couple more. Yep. Uh, let's uh, move it on. Yep, please. Okay, so um, get some highlights. Yep, here. last two slides. Just that again, our DER advisory service is really in a scaling mode. We, we went from maybe 10, 20 megawatts of uh, DERs, distributed energy resources, solar and storage, to uh, nearly 300. Uh, the next area of focus there is aggregating assets. So again, when we think about evolving our products and services, it's taking the assets that we're supporting our customers, integrating, uh, whether it's solar storage or behind the meter, even in buildings with their HVAC units, et cetera, and ensuring with that digital overlay, they can get monetized in the market as, as distribution markets evolve and as the NISO brings in kind of uh, advanced uh, dynamic load management or dem demand side management. The other area of focus here is around building the, on the success of our advisory services and recognizing, as you pointed out, that we are energy experts and that we are meant to be shepherding our, our customers who may not be as sophisticated or where their core competency is not energy and ensuring that we're helping them make the adequate, uh, adequate trade-off decisions. And that's in the evolution of an integrated offering. And then finally, last slide. Um, I mentioned to you that we're very focused um, and it was great to hear that we got a, uh, a plus on um, MWB from the state. We also in commercial ops are looking at, uh, at, at developing metrics around the amount of investment that we're undertaking in disadvantaged communities and continuing to support the, the DEI metric that we've incorporated into a hydro allocation program. And then as much as we like to think COVID is over, we're really living with COVID still and wanted to highlight the work that we're doing with health and hospitals corporation in supporting you know, our emergency services with ongoing uh, projects uh, to ensure that they have ongoing energy operations and would just highlight their, the innovative technologies we're using because sometimes you think of energy efficiency as a state and mature entity or a business or equipment, but there we're looking at using refrigerants that have less impact on greenhouse gases, as well as, as you know, they're breaking regenerative systems and we're using those in the elevators to reduce the demand on energy. 
And fundamentally, uh, again, as I started with, uh, as chief commercial officer, I take commercial um, to heart in the name of my title and really are looking at driving commercial strategies to support and preserve our hydro to transition off of our fossil fuels reliably and ultimately to decarbonize our customer and state. And again, want to thank um, the board for recognizing uh, the value of the customer and how important it is for us to remain competitive in providing both energy supply and other products and services. Um, may, may I? Yep, sure. Um, so listening to your, uh, your presentation, mm -hmm. it's just it's such a reminder how dynamic this entire technology is. It reminds me also of the old saying that, you know, an oxymoron is a long-term technology project because the technology changes so fast. Yeah. And then thinking to Joe's comment, which was kind of startling, but but so accurate that canals, you know, became obsolete in, in, in so many respects in terms of commercial traffic. So I guess the big question is, does what what what's the future of hydro? You know, when you take a look, I look at the two pie charts, right? One is supply and one is utilization. Mm -hmm. And so as you look, you know, not just five years, but 10 years down the line, what happens to hydro? Mm -hmm. Have you have you guys been Thinking yeah. about this, is this a you know, focus of study? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now, um, hydro hydropower is becoming more of a regulating um, force in the market. It used to be base load, now base load or must run, must run renewables like uh, wind and solar. And so, again, as I highlighted, I'm looking at ensuring and supporting that we're creating and reinstituting potential base load coming from our hydros with overlays of intermittent renewables so that we can ultimately get to 100% renewable pr product. In the end, we have to, as Joe pointed out, and, and you know, as was mentioned by Dean you know, or Justin, we have to continue to have a very fine pencil on our cost competitiveness and our cost of service. And that goes across, across the en uh, entity and not just with um, the O&M that we're undertaking the capital investments to ensure that our assets are there. I mean, clearly we're lobbying um, in the NISO and other areas uh, for the recognition and market products in the NISO for the value of the reliable hydro that we mm -hmm. have. Um, but uh, from my perspective as chief commercial officer, I'm trying to ensure that we can be competitive also too in the market that currently exists while we push for those other opportunities. Thank you. I would propose, Mr. Chair, that at some point we should have a more in-depth discussion around hydros from a strategic sure. perspective Happy. and maybe yeah. maybe bringing in some outside third-party yeah. sources yeah. to talk to have a more in-depth discussion around this. I think yeah. we'll talk with Justin. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to share our strategy. Fun fundamentally, our hydro is serving a different role now than it did in the past, as Sarah talked about, because we're basically we're balancing the wind and solar that's yeah. coming on the system. Mm -hmm. So we're being asked to ramp up and down a lot more frequently, yeah. which is causing wear and tear on our yeah. systems. Uh, and so we we almost need and how some, we deliver that most efficiently and you know yeah. even lower cost, et cetera. There's almost right. need some kind of recognition of the firming role that hydro is playing in the markets. Yeah. We, we're not we're not getting a subsidy. We're the only renewable without a market subsidy right now. Yeah, I think no, no question. Um, Thanks very much, Thank Sarah. You. I mean, that, that theme, I know, as Adam makes his way to the podium, uh, Eves is the quarterback on strategy. We've talked a lot. Anything you want to add here in terms of how you and the, the team continue to think dynamically, nimbly, in light of all of this and how we can better interact within the context of, you know, what we're chatting about and what you talk about on a regular basis? Anything you want to add, add to the discussion? Sure. So... Two, two things that I'd like to add. First, like for the simple answer to where we see hydropower going in the future, like we, it's a critical base for our renewable, um, for the new renewable future, right? Like that's how we're gonna, de that's how we're gonna be able to decarbonize. And what we are doing is we've set up a strategic priority and five tactics and four tactics focused on preserving that value. And it's all of that sort of the advocacy, the, um, ensuring that our assets are maintained, ensuring that, you know, that we're having offtake agreements and ensuring that we're looking at the future and how we're gonna maintain these assets. So we'll come back to you and give you more of a detailed um, understanding of like what are specifically happening um, with our hydropower, but that, that's what we're already doing. And then the second point that I'd like to make is that 
there is a market sensing function that my organization is currently doing where we're actually feeding in it's like all the things that are happening in the environment, learning and adapting and added, adding that to the discussion on um, the discussion on our, our strategic vision 2030. And every month we sit and have a discussion with all the tactic leaves around what they're doing and how they're performing against that. And we're the, I guess the goal going forward is bringing a little bit more of that understanding up to this level. Yeah. Yeah. I just think we need to shock the system, like put in a dramatic case of what it might be, not to maintain the assets, but what if we no longer have those as a benefit to the organization? Absolutely. And, and this type of, of, of questioning also maybe this is a little bit of heresy, but the whole 2030 vision, you know, uh, it's, it's changing, you know, and, and it may be, maybe the goals remain the same, but how we get there is, is changing. We should, we should really be aware of, of what that dynamic is as we, and what our role is going to be going forward. Yeah. It's like the U S constitution. It's a living document. Right. It's going to be changing. Right. But even as we said earlier, that you know the hydro represents such a significant base of the starting point for the state to reach its goals. If policy allows that to be cannibalized, it's going to only put pressure yeah. on more costs for more renewables rather than doing what's necessary to at least maintain that base as being viable. Well, so just they could be point shooting that, themselves in the foot, right? If, right? if you if you lose subsidies for the other renewables. You know, we're going to have tremendous challenges, whereas we don't get subsidies. So that in and of itself should be a very important um, aspect of this. Yep. Yeah, hence the advocacy initiative and you know, all yep. the rest of that. So yep. we can't work against ourselves. On the other hand, we can't control what we can't control and need to ensure that um, we, we don't uh, see it blow up on us unexpectedly. All right. Well, yep. Eves, let's figure out the right way, you know, Justin, uh, to, to continue to elevate the discussion alongside as a board. You know, our focus is strategy, you know, risk and, you know, operations is a relatively distant third. So, you know, let's keep, you know, elevating our focus. And as we see the world evolving all the more rapidly and uncontrollably, um, ensure we're appropriately positioned to within it and managing and navigating the risks associated uh, with that. Okay. Since what we used to think were uh, unlikely risks are now very much, you know, front right, center. right, right sure. in front of us. You know, the hundred-year storm that happens uh, every ten years. Yeah, yeah or, <laughs> if we're lucky, every ten years, you know, or the, the, you know, the existential risks that eh, I don't know. That's let's we can you know tabletop it, but. Now there it is, and now it's right in front right. of us that we're just uh, that much more adaptive on and on top of our game. Okay. Okay. We'll do. Yep. Yeah. With that, sure. Adam. Um, Good morning, uh, trustees, members of staff, and the public. Um, as as you recall, we went through the first two months. We can change the slide um, at the finance committee, uh, showing how that we are running ahead of target. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, energy prices cold January and, and February are contributing to some of that. Um, also provided in your materials, mm -hmm. looking at the different yeah. prices going forward in terms of budget forecast. We do see this reverting back to <laughs> towards our budget uh, capacity prices we see being elevated for the rest of state, but yet underperforming the budget forecast for downstate. Uh, so we see this somewhat normalizing over the over the course of the year. But again, as uh, was presented in, in Sarah's um, uh, presentation, we do expect it to go uh, ahead of forecast or ahead of budget between now and the end of the year. Why don't we go to the uh, so you're managing to our expectations? Managing oh, our okay. Thank you. Adam. I mean, it's pretty cold today, so I'm yeah, thinking yeah. March oh, might, yeah, yeah. Strong. It might be good. Might be good. Cold March. Right. right. Okay, exactly. you're going to move right on to the next slide. Though. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, this is the forecast. So, so we are we are showing that we're going to be um, you know starting to trend higher than planned. Um, and what I'll kind of take away or nuance some of this is that we broke out separately when you look at expenses that one of the byproducts of the higher energy prices, especially ahead of the uh, tariff rates, are for our monetized funds, you know, Western New York, um, Northern New York, 
uh, those uh, additional revenues we receive above the tariff get deposited into economic development funds back to them. So they will actually benefit from the higher prices. Um, again, showing that the, you know, the forecast right now with the model shows that we should be doing uh, 283 by the end of the year on the 266 million for our merchant um, uh, revenue from our, our plants. Uh, basically 17 million ahead of budget, transmission running ahead, non-utility a little behind. Um, also, we put into this forecast, which I'll, you know, it, it won't affect EBITDA or cash, but from a net income standpoint, we did build in $10 million for uh, potential mark to market uh, adjustments on our investment portfolio. We have a large investment portfolio that we are uh, putting into work now, but as you know, interest rates are rising, and that has the impact of making the mark to market on our portfolio less from an unrealized standpoint, just in terms of valuation and then government or counting <laughs> those unrealized mark to market losses have to run through income, which is a little bit different than in, in private sector. Now, all of our securities, we always expect to hold to maturity. So that was unrealized, um, losses, if you will, disappear by the time the securities mature. But for net, net income purposes, uh, we could see an impact on that during during this year. But again, Adam, what dictates when we do that? What's that? What dictates the timing of when we do this mark to market? Every every month. Every month. So we do it every okay. Every month. So this but, was as okay. Yeah, so Got it. but now we're forecasting out and we'll talk a little bit more about um We'll give you an update on our bond issue, but as you see right. that the interest rates have gone up, inflation right. expectations, credit spreads have widened. Uh, this has an impact throughout the financial system and on our portfolio as well. Okay. The Fed has uh, announced that they're going to increase rates seven times this year. Um, yeah. It could be, you know, could be more. sooner and more, yeah. depending on whether or not they feel they're staying ahead of inflation. So that will have a negative impact on the valuation of our securities. Because I'm sure going into the year, you probably had the assumption was what four, probably four times an increase, and now yeah, it's seven. And so, barely. right, yeah, okay. So it's, it's a little more than we had, we had expected. Okay. Um, but with that, I want to give some um, other updates on our bond sale in terms of uh, supporting Vision 2030. As you know, one of those uh, uh, key priorities is to become a leader in transmission. And our ability to do that because it's very capital intensive in a way that doesn't hurt our credit rating and doesn't impact our ability to do all the other state of good repair and other works we have. We have created this brand new credit, which is a green transmission bond revenue credit, um, which has been highly rated. It's in double A category and we're in the market this week, uh, starting our marketing, very aggressive marketing strategy. We're in Boston yesterday meeting with some of the largest mutual funds uh, will be at the JP Morgan Investor Conference. I'll be presenting there on Thursday and Wednesday. We'll be meeting with one-on-ones with investors. So doing a very aggressive outreach there, as well as an internet. Justin and I did a internet virtual roadshow where investors can go on and watch if they don't want to in a place where we can meet person to person. And we're also just doing advertising to retail investors because we think some people may want to invest in New York's green uh, transitions. So uh, we're, we're excited about this uh, transaction, but because it's new, it needs to be explained to people so they understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and why this is uh, something they should want to invest in. So but we're very, uh, very excited about that. We think the, uh, you know, the market has been very, very choppy, very challenged because of, as I mentioned before, the interest rate hikes, inflation expectations, Ukraine, all this uncertainty. So we're going to monitor the market throughout the week. We would like to get in and price next week because the week after there'll be a PPI and CPI print. And if that's higher than people are thinking about, that'll spook the market again. So we'd like to get in ahead of that and lock it in and, you know, take what we can get. In, in this type of choppy market, unless there's a major event or disruption. Um, so 
just wanted to make sure everybody's got an update on that. And I'll keep you apprised as we go out through, throughout the week as we've done in the past. Well, good. Well, we, have, we have a ceiling on you know, pricing, though. I mean, we're not going to take what we can get at any no, price. No, no. We, I mean, we're going to look for good execution. Oh, absolutely. The right execution. Yes. And, uh, absolutely. Even saying okay. in general, the market has backed off from where it is. Yeah. So we're not in the most ideal places we would have been, say, yeah, well, four or five months ago. But recent remarks but, that it could bounce 50 basis points and they're yes. determining some of the inversion and the spreads and all the rest of that. Our pricing isn't going to be what you hoped it would, was two weeks ago. So, but as long as we're staying constrained, because yes. any any execution isn't, you know, we want the good execution. Absolutely. Okay. And that's why we're doing this aggressive marketing effort. Um, we're looking at other deals that are in the market. The New York City Transitional Finance Authority is coming to the market this week. We'll use that as a benchmark. It's a very strong credit. Uh, so we'll use that to see where we are relative to that in the following week. So, um, you know, we, we expect it to be probably in the range of where we were in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, which if we can get okay. in, into those, you know, something yep. below 4%, yep. I think it's a, it's a win for us. And we go in a very, with a very strong credit rating. And so, yes, congratulations and, and, to the team yeah, on that. And, and so. our argument here is that aside from NIFA, this is completely separate than NIFA. We are telling people that, the, cr the credit of this structure is the strength of the FERC regulatory order, yeah. the strength of the NISO rate base, which is 20 million paying rate payers, which this will be very small impact on them, and that this is a standalone credit, which will give us the ability to take on more of these transmission projects. The two projects that will be financed as part of this is the Central East Energy Connect and the Smart Path project. And that'll total about $600 million in PAR bonds, $675 million in proceeds. And probably by the time those are in service, we'll be coming to the market with Smart Path Connect. And hopefully if we win the bid for the, the seniors we discussed, uh, that'll be also in the queue for that as well. So we have a good pipeline of, of projects. Nice that, runway, no question. Yes, so, uh, and that's a good story. So that people will see that we'll be back with a credit that is different, but is very strong and something they want to have in their portfolio, especially because it'll be 100% green. Well, yeah, that's just gonna say that that's that's kind of offsets in some of the risks that the people want to. There's a real appetite in the market Absolutely. to invest in green. So there's there's, there's pressure focus. from investors, from boards, from everybody that you know for these investment managers they want to see either they have um, funds that are completely dedicated to ESG green mm -hmm. or they want to have them have, no matter what their portfolio is, shoot for certain targets to have green in their portfolio. Um, I think it's great you're leaning into the retail space. I mean, yep. see, see where it goes, but uh, kudos for you know trying to push into their retail space. And uh, it's important to everybody. Everybody wants to have an opportunity and they look at larger deals and say, yeah, I wish I could have played. Well, here's a real opportunity to do that. So, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're excited and we'll, again, we'll keep you up to date on, on what's going on. Uh, the other things we we're talking about in terms of uh, Vision 2030 and resilience issues, this is an update as well as we are going through our risk assessment process. And uh, we'll come back and show you the results of that, but the conversations and dialogue with, with the chairman, um, just talking about those existential or low probability, but high impact type events. We're gonna make a focus on that and come back to you and, and explain uh, what we see are those type of events and what we could do uh, to to mitigate those. We're going to use some outside help as well so that it's just not, you know, just internal type of thing that we're getting the benefit of some other uh, people taking a fresh look. And, uh, and, and on that on that vein, um, we've been thinking about this for a long time. Just another update. One of, I think, a key component of our risk strategy from a financial insurance standpoint is we've been trying to get authorization from the state to create our own captive insurance company. And mm -hmm. this will allow us to um, purchase insurance for things that we can't get insurance for today. We would be immediately available to the federal terrorism backstop facility, mm -hmm. which is over you know, several billion dollars of uh, support and backstop we wouldn't be otherwise able to access as well as um, other catastrophic events. We talked about hydro. We might be able to protect against a huge unexpected drop in hydro flow. Um, 
and other major events that that could happen uh, to to NYPA that we couldn't get. To. <coughs> We'd be able to access the reinsurance market, the Lloyd's market overseas that you know we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And it's been six, successful for other uh, authorities around the state, MTA, Port Authority. You know, after 9/11, uh, couldn't get insurance on their buildings. Right. This this helps them do that. But I want to thank uh, Justin for his leadership. Uh, with the chamber uh, expressing how important this was uh, to NIPA and explaining a complicated topic uh, to you know some people that are uh, layman um, and and the team of Vince Esposito and uh, um, Joe Leary and our legislative people we have our bill has passed both the assembly and the senate great and it was in the governor's budget so we expect him to sign it so it's a real positive development. I think it will be a game changer in terms of our risk management. Very good. Right. Yep, good news. Very good news. Any other questions? Is that enough good news for one day? You're going to raise 600 million green you bonds. You take it, Adam, while you can. Okay. <laughs> and we're off to a great start that will extrapolate forward uh, for the balance of the year. 28 times 6. Okay, I'm going to do that. Now. Okay, all right. Anything else for Adam? Thanks so much, everyone. All right. Okay. Oh, that's right, too. As You've got yep. uh, late yep. breaking. Uh, <laughs> yep. So uh, next slide, please. So this is to help um, to really uh, invigorate and uh, catalyze the development that's happening Buffalo Waterfront. Uh, these were uh, monies that we had agreed to as part of our relicensing. And what we're doing here is allowing them to accelerate the payments. We will be fronting the money so that can make best use of it now rather than just taking it over time. And we think this is uh, an important for economic development in terms of our mission and areas that are important to us uh, like Buffalo and Niagara. Um, this will allow us to front $27 million on payments that would have equaled 32 over uh, seven years. Uh, so it's, a, it's really a present value of those payment streams and it'll, it'll allow them to, uh, um, to support their projects that they're doing with the canal side project. Is there any questions on that? It's just moving it further to the left in terms of our, your disbursement of this funding. That's, that's right. Yeah. yeah, it's a multi-year, yep. we're making payments every year. I think we've done this once before. Yes, we did. We accelerated payments, you know, once before to, you know, support. Back in 2009, yeah. did the similar, uh, similar program. So right. this isn't this isn't a first, but okay. there was a need out there to say, hey, if we could get the money up front, they could under and start these projects now and get those completed. So we think it's uh, it's good for economic development. Yeah, we're we're a key player in uh, the Buffalo waterfront front development. Uh, much of what happens there is uh, as a result of uh, you know, the subsidies we provide and the support we provide. So. So this is a separate motion. It's not part of because we didn't cover it in the financial right. committee. So it, so correct. Right. It came uh, to us recently. It's been talked about for quite a while, but uh, yeah. the the definitive request was just received. So yeah, and then and also it's arm's length, right? So because we are doing a net present value of those payments, we are agnostic from an economic standpoint. So it's yeah. not it's not hurting us one bit. Do you need a motion? Yes. 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 So moved. Second. Second. Any other any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. But we can round it off to 27 1. I mean 27 <laughs> 09, 8, 8, 8, 18. You know, we're pretty driving a hard bargain there, Adam. I appreciate right. that. Uh round it up. Round it off 27 1. You know, it's easier to write it up. So <laughs> sounds good. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adam. I uh, appreciate it. All right. Uh, as Adam just referenced, uh, that wasn't included in uh, what will next be um, our uh, Finance and Risk Committee report. Uh, we had uh, Finance and Risk Committee as well as Audit Committee uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Governance Committee uh, this morning. So uh, with that, as always, uh, there were a number of uh, initiatives and recommendations coming out of Finance Committee, and for that, I'll turn to uh, Committee Chair Tracy McKibben. 
Thank you. As you said, we had the Finance and Risk Committee meeting on March 18th. Um, we adopted the minutes. We also received three staff reports and adopted uh, nine items that uh, I'll go through um, now because um, there are a number that are open uh, that we will need approval from the full board for. The first is the approval and adoption of a resolution amending the authority's 2020 revolving credit and note purchase agreements. This is to provide for a sublimit to permit the bank's, par bank's party thereto to issue letters of credit for an amount up to 150 million as an alternative to cash postings for collateral purposes pursuant to NIPA's hedging activities with counterparts. NIPA will be obligated to reimburse the banks for any amounts drawn on such letters of credit. The existing 2020 revolving credit and note purchase credit agreements will be extended for an additional one year term as of April 20th, 2022, pursuant to um, the existing trustee approval. Next item is the Q2 22 uh, release of the additional up to 21.3 million in funding to the Canal Corporation to support the operations of the New York State Canal Corporations. This is our regular funding approval. The next is the, to recommend the approval of a two 10 year equipment contracts for the engineering, design, testing, furnishing, and delivery of high voltage circuit breakers to Hitachi Energy USA of Riley, North Carolina, and Siemens Energy of Orlando, Florida. And this is in the aggregate amount of $50 million. Um, also recommending approval of the two 10 year equipment contracts for the engineering, design, testing, furnishing, and delivery of substation transformers and reactors to Hitachi Energy USA, again, of Cary, North Carolina, and Royal Smith, SMIT, Transformers, BV of the Netherlands, in the aggregate amount of $110 million. Also asking for the approval of capital expenditures in the amount of $13 million for the replacement of the Robert Moses Power Dam Auto Transformer 1 project. And then approval of a 12 valve value contract, 12 value contract for architecture and engineering design services in the aggregate amount of 20 million to BKSK, Cooper Robertson, Fisher Associates, Interborough, OSD, OBI. Easy for you to say. SPB, Star White House, Shop Studio V, WRT, and WXY. <laughs> Z. Oh. <laughs> exactly. They left off the Z for a term of up to five years. And then this next item, which we've talked to about extensively, and the team is going to come back as we have a more thorough review of these continuing waivers that we've done, is the approval of a waiver of the requirement of the authority's agreement of Article 22, still components, for the procurement mm. of manual and motor operated disconnect switches. This requested wa waiver is required to award a value contract to GE Grid Solutions, LLC, for the purchase of manual and motor-operated disconnect switches. And then uh, approval of a 10-year equipment contract for the furnishing and delivery of transmission conductor and OHGW to Midal Cables Limited of Ascar Bahrain in the amount of $20 million. And then finally, uh, to affirm the transfer of 17.5 million in funds to the state's general fund as authorized by section 17 of part JJJ of chapter 59 of the laws of 2021, that it is feasible and advisable and authorize such payments. No lawyers had anything to do with that statement. Um, <laughs> I now ask for a motion to adopt these Any items. Any other rules or regs you want <laughs> exactly. to cite? It's like you can tell lawyers were involved in that. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Tracy. So move. <laughs> we had uh, ample discussion uh, throughout finance and each of those, not to make light of uh, any of that significant yeah. dollars and significant programs and initiatives uh, across the, the board, uh, which is why we take it in committee to ensure it gets, uh, uh, you know, ample Good focus discussion. and dialogue. So uh, motion uh, made and seconded, uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. With reservations, I expressed at the committee meeting on March 18th on number nine. Du yes, duly, absolutely. Duly noted. Um, any opposed motion 
Uh, carried. All right, thanks very much, uh, Tracy. Judge, um, we had an audit committee report uh, at the, you know, preceding or after or finance, I forget which, but uh, you have a, a report relative to uh, our year-end financials and the like. I do. Uh, on March 18th, the audit committee received a report and approved and adopted the New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation 2022 Environmental Health and Safety Compliance Audit Plan. Uh, we had approval of uh, 2021 financial reports. I would, uh, trustees are asked to approve the consideration of financial report for the year ending December 31st of last year based on the representation of the authority's interim president and chief executive officer and the unqualified opinion issued by uh, KPMG authorized the corporate secretary to submit it, uh, the report to the governor and legislative leaders and state controllers and ABO under the public authorities law and approve and authorize posting of a report actual versus budgeted results for 2021 on the authorities website. I would ask for a motion to approve those three items. I have a motion. So Second. Thank you, B. Uh, second by Tracy. Again, ample uh, discussion, good dialogue, KPMG at length, et cetera, during our audit committee meeting, unless there's any other uh, questions for uh, the judge. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion to carry. Thanks very much, uh, Judge. And as I said, we had a uh, governance uh, committee report uh, this morning ably led by our governance committee chair, Mr. Trainer Dennis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the governance committee met this morning, March 29th, adopted minutes, received three staff reports, and adopted the following seven items, which are now for the trustees for adoption. The first item is approval and adoption of procurement and related reports for the New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation. Next is approval and adoption of the annual report of procurement contracts, guidelines for procurement contracts, and annual review of open procurement service contracts. Next is the approval and adoption of annual review and approval of guidelines for disposal of personal property and expenditure authorization procedures for the New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation. Next is approval and adoption of annual review and approval of guidelines and procedures for disposal of real property, acquisition of real property, annual reports for the disposal and acquisition of real property, and expenditure of authorization procedures. Next is approval and adoption of annual review and approval of certain policies for New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation. Next is approval and adoption of the 2021 New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation's board evaluation pursuant the sections 2800 and 2824 of the public authorities law and guidance of the authorities budget office. Next, approval and adoption of the annual review and approval of guidelines for the investment of funds and 2021 annual report of investment or authority funds. I ask for a motion to adopt these aforementioned items. So moved. Thank you, Michael. Second. Second. Thanks, Tracy. Um, any other uh, questions, uh, given our dialogue and discussion this morning? Otherwise, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. Thanks very much, Dennis, uh, Judge, and Tracy, uh, for your continued good work and uh, those focused uh, reports. That moves us to uh, consent agenda, uh, which is always uh, provides us uh, with good content uh, to uh, digest in advance of uh, today's meeting. Um, as always, if anyone has any questions, I know the staff and team are uh, prepared to be responsive. Otherwise, I'd ask for a motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Thank Second. you, Dennis. Second, uh, <clears throat> Tracy. Unless there are any other questions, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Uh, motion uh, carried. Um, with that, um, the uh, remainder of our meeting will be uh, conducted in executive uh, session. We will 
reconvene in open session, but merely to adjourn our meeting. So um, I would ask uh, that we, uh, for a motion to conduct an executive session, session to discuss the financial credit history uh, pursuant to section 105 of the public officer's law. Thank you, Dennis. Second. Second, Tracy, all in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Said uh, we'll be an extended uh, executive session. Uh, we will, uh, said, resume in open session, but merely to uh, close out the meeting. Uh, so I thank everyone for their uh, participation today and uh, look forward to seeing you again in a couple months. Thanks very much. We're now in exec session. Uh, welcome back, uh, every, everyone. Um, uh, if I could, uh, I'd ask for a motion to uh, resume our meeting in open session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. As always, I uh, remind everyone no votes uh, were taken while we were in uh, executive session. Uh, unless anyone has any other matters to bring before uh, us as a board today, um, I would ask for a motion to adjourn our meeting. So moved. Second. All right. Thanks, Michael. Tracy, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, our meeting is uh, closed. Uh, thank you one and all for a great discussion. Have a great day. Stay safe. Stay well. And uh, if not before, we'll see you in May.